היי, שלום פילי. היי צילי, ואנחנו פה כל פעם להיות מספיירד על אנשים שכבר אנחנו מתכוונים היום are dealing with much more, uh, I don't know, interesting, uh, important uh, stuff than what we do. And you'll see in a minute. So this is Rafi Malach. He's a professor at Nachon Weizmann, which is Weizmann Malach. Institute. Sure. Malach. As a Malach. It's angel. Ah, angel. Rafi the angel. Rafael yeah. the angel. The why, why, why? Is it? Rafael the yeah. angel. Wow, why, why? Listen, so... Silly, I know uh, Rafi for many, many years. I must admit that me and Yankale, my husband, love him. Really, really love him. Three days ago, we went to Jerusalem to, um, when he had received the Emet uh, Prize, which is the Prime Minister Prime, Prime Minister Prize for Culture and Science and, and Science and one more. Are you going to look? Don't, don't, don't. Anyway, it's really the Nobel Prize, Israeli Nobel Prize. This is really considered to be the Israeli Nobel Prize. Rafi got it three days ago, uh, and he got it. He will tell us, but what I understood, and correct me, and this is my introduction, that you are dealing uh, a lot with the brain, a vision, Maybe Rafi will tell us what he's... He, he uh, will, will. He will. I'll tell you more details. Yeah, and of course, he has to tell us what it is, because he's also uh, dealing with uh, Toda'a, which is, in English, Toda'a. Consciousness. Con- Consciousness. Consciousness. So there are a lot of things, you know, which are connected. Talk. I just have to say <laughs> one more thing. One, that is also appreciate philosophy, and we'll see the connection, but also music. Okay. And I think paintings, and I think theater. So it's really like the combination of a scientist and all the goodies. All the goodies. So uh, that's it. And um, now you can tell us what, what do you do? That's right. <laughs> yes. Um, I think uh, where I'm really excited about and what I'm focusing most of my work. is in this border between the human brain. The human brain is a physical object. You know, it's considered one of the most, uh, if not the most complicated organ that exists that human science knows about. So we have the physical, complex, amazing structure called the human brain. And then we have this universe we call psychology, which includes basically everything we experience from uh, seeing uh, the sunset in Gordon Beach, to tasting uh, wine, to thinking, to thinking about science, all uh, we can call mental phenomena. And of course, we have this vast uh, universe that we are not directly, is not directly available to us, which is called the subconscious universe. So the question is, as, as a scientist, brain scientist, we believe there is a total, absolute, A connection between this physical entity that is inside our head, we call the brain, our brain, and this universe of experiences. And the rules that connect this, the rules that connect this um, play of electrical signals in our brain, how they lead to me seeing the sunset, this is a big, big mystery that some philosophers will argue will never be solved. And uh, although I'm actually tending to, to, to this kind of thinking, uh, still building the bridge between our brain and the uh, experience. And the two major fields within this huge ocean of questions that thousands of scientists are working on, Uh, my direct interest was how we create, and I emphasize the word create here, the visual images that we see, and how we uh, come up with the spontaneous creative behavior in general. What so these two uh, mysteries <coughs> um, uh, are the focus of my, of my studies, my research, and my discoveries. 
and uh, we can discuss them uh, each yeah, uh, each Raf, one of them is create? a fascinating amazing Just create this is very very important i want to understand because we I, have what, if I, wait a second i want to understand exactly the the connection okay. um cp and i grew up in the same place in kikar disengolf it's a disengolf square in the middle of tel aviv yeah we had we had the same experience in the neighborhood then they elevated the the square, the square, they changed everything and they killed the area. Lately, they took down the, the square, they brought it back more or less to what it used to be, but not really. We both go back to Tel Aviv. I tell CP that our Tel Aviv is gone and it's very different. And CP says, no, everything is exactly the same. We see the same objects but we feel toward it totally differently. I see it as it is, and it's not exactly what we, we saw when we were kids. And she sees what we saw when we were kids. How do you, because I believe that this is something that has to do with what you're talking about. Exactly, you actually, you could have taken my place to actually sort of set up the idea because a simple way to describe an image of this thing of uh, Kikar thing of, of your making and simply looking at the same object. So both of them, both of you opening your eyes, absorbing exactly the same physical situation, simply created like an artist, a unique uh, picture of her own. Now, if we deeply, deeply think about it, and as a visual neuroscientist, I deeply think about it, you gradually realize that you don't even have a clue, or, or it doesn't even make sense, and philosophers dealt with a lot with it, it doesn't even make sense to ask, so what is the true Kikar Dizengoff? There is well, not true Kikar Dizengoff, it's all a creation elaborate creation, very, very sophisticated creation uh, that you and CP are making. Each one makes its own creation. Of course, okay. then people that I tell them that come with the counter argument. Oh, so how do we agree? You know, you both look at me and we agree that Rafi is there on the screen and all that. So, so the question is, why do we need all this creation? Why do and we need are, to create the images? But the question that, is that will help us understand why we are have a common ground in our creative images. But, but you there wanted is to ask a something. technical thing between the nerves in the brain and the vision, and there's the psychological or emotional level. So something is given, and something is basically created over the years by the personality. How do you play between, how do you balance the whole thing? Yes, so, so there is one idea, I, I don't like the separation of seeing and psychology. Seeing to me is a psychological creation. Yeah. Yeah, it's a kind of psychology of seeing. The real, uh, well, you call it technical, I call it amazing or mis mystery. The central mystery is how do you move from nerve cells which, you know, all they do, you know, when we look inside the brain, all you find is millions and millions of tiny little uh, bodies that emits little pulses of electricity that if, you know, you, we use the skids to put a battery to the tongue to feel what electricity is. If you put uh, uh, your tongue to these neurons, you'll barely feel anything. And yet this exchange of millions of neurons sending uh, signals to each other suddenly, you have the kikardism of popping out in your mind. It is directly related to this popping, uh, this dynamic, I call it dancing or dialogue between these nerve cells. This is the, the most amazing phenomena, I think, science encounters, and we don't understand. If you ask me why, why this bunch of pulses that move between these nerves suddenly create the image of kikardism, I cannot really answer you. I can, can find the rules. For example, it has to happen in the back of your brain. If it will happen in the front of your brain, this exchange of activity, you will experience um, urge to do something. You will experience maybe language. 
But if you want to experience vision, it has to happen in the back of the brain. So, so we know some rules, some, some connecting rules between physical activity in the brain and, uh, and the images we create. Now you can ask and another question, and you asked it, what comes into the mix that makes me create my specific image as opposed to Tsipi? And here, indeed, there is a huge amount of pre-existing information. Some of it you are born with. You know, there is evolution of millions of years that shaped our networks, our neurons, built our visual system. So as an infant is born, he's already seeing the world in a human-like fashion, not elaborate, not sophisticated, not developed yet, but very, very different than, let's say, a, a dog that is born and looks at the world. And then, of course, we have the experience. We have the childhood. We have the training by the parents. We have the traumas that make us suddenly be afraid of things and, and not afraid of other things. These all come into the mix of, of uh, eventually allowing us with this machinery or this magic that allows us to be a creative human being that can, can we direct images of... Can we, can, do we have, can we be proactive in directing the brain? Of course. For example, I'll give you an example in my field. I became, I started as, as a neuroanatomist, it's called somebody who studies the structure of brain uh, networks, circuits, you know, how they actually look. And as, as you get trained more and more and more in looking at these things, you start to see them completely different than you come. I know uh, uh, when visitors used to come, you know, to the Weizmann Institute, let's say you want to recruit um, donations and all that. So you have a... Um, Amateurs come and look at the images that you are used to see. They see something completely different. If you go to a medical doctor with a broken knee and he looks at a CT scan or MR scan of your knee, he will see something completely different than yours. So training, experience. If you are a movie director, you might be looking at you know, a scene in a completely different manner the time that comes to it from, let's say, a different field or a different domain so you can train yourself training experience what you were exposed as a child will all come into this game of uh, allowing you to create images. so what this knowledge how do we apply it practically to the real world no to our life to everyday life the the the, the most important thing to me <clears throat> you know first of all we have to understand uh, I think it's important to understand why we need to create these images. You know, why can't we simply act like robots without all this creative act? These creative images allow us to function in the world. If you want to cross a, a road, you must create images of moving uh, cars at particular speed, at particular velocity. You must know which one you should be afraid of, which are not, and all that. This is all comes... And this is the reason why we have this amazing visual system. It allows us to pick up fruits in the supermarket. It allows us to move correctly in the world. So, so it, it serves an amazing function in allowing us to survive, to operate properly in the world. Rafi, how do now, you apply? Okay. We have the tendency, yes. and I find it more CP and I is, uh, live also in New York, so we have the tendency to look for things that remind us what's familiar. So we move around and we, like all over the United States, and we always look for things that remind us of some place of home, or the smell is like home, or something from childhood. Does it apply to the same department in the brain, or it's only emotional? Uh... First of all, I'm not sure I agree with you about the search for familiar things. I mean, familiar things, uh, we are moving into a completely different domain. We'll talk a little bit about it, but they can also be, you know, there is the pheno phenomenon of boredom. You know, we don't, you go and watch the same movie five times, and the, the fifth time you don't want to look at the screen anymore. So it's not true that familiarity is always a, a positive thing. Sometimes it's we, we try to escape it. We want new things. We want to go to new places. We don't want to be in the same um, 
Kikar doesn't go again and again and again every every moment no, every there, day. So are... novelty is a, actually a very stimulant. But you now, know this. They... Okay. And now there is the issue of uh, emotional security. There you're completely correct that we like to be um, sort of yes. um, in a more familiar ground. We want to be uh, less. We feel less threatened. When, when things are familiar, you can predict better how to react to them so you know better how to deal and you feel more secure. So this has an adaptive, adaptive uh, value. But I want to go back to the question that Zipi asked me. What is it good for? Wow, well, how should we apply it to the world? And, also, the can we just, and also, can we just look at behavior and learn as much as we need and we don't have to go to the brain or why to go to the brain? But let's, I want to make a comment that I've, to me is the most important in all this uh, conversation. Uh, and people tip, typically are put off by it, but I insist like a messiah to, to keep on it. The most important thing about my research and my understanding and my insight is very simple. It is wonder, the sense of, of amazement, of awe. In other words, and we all suffer from it, including myself. We wake up in the morning and, you know, oh, the news, the newspaper, the coffee, how boring, how mundane, so used to, we and no effort, you know, we just open our eyes, we see everything, big deal. We take things for granted too much. The moment you start to study this, you realize that we are, I know I'm, I'm speaking here uh, freely with the loose language that I might regret, but we are basically a walking miracle if you think about it. I mean, the machine, mm -hmm. the amazing machine that is sitting there uh, in our skull, its ability to create, you know, I was now in the Biennale in, in, uh, in Venice, which was dedicated to, to surrealism and the amazing imagine. Uh, imagination capability of the human mind is simply unlimited. I mean, it's unlimited in richness, in color, in scope, in unexpected things. What I'm trying to say is try to, to resist our tendency to assume that the world is boring, expected, taken for granted, mundane. It's not, it's a magic. It's some kind of miracle that is happening every time we open our eyes. Yeah, but and once uh, people you know, don't like to hear that, but that's no, the no, no, main no. message of the research. But once, let's say, theoretically, you know the connection and the meaning and how it affects the vision, how it affects the uh, physicality, ta, 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 ta. So once you know it, it's all the same for most human beings. And the only thing you can detect, malfunction of one of the connections, right? Otherwise, it's all the same. Uh, it's all the same. It's too strong a word. We are similar. We have common properties. Otherwise, we'll not be able to agree on anything. You know, I'll look at you and I'll see, I don't know, and one thing, and then somebody else will see something totally, absolutely different. So we agree, you know, in, we are common sense. And that's because we are challenged by the same demands of the environment. You know, that's why we need to create images of similar kind, but that does not mean that we're identical. As we discussed, you know, a very nice example I, I used to show in my lectures is this visual illusion when you see, you show a rotating dancer, spinning dancer. And for some reason, some people see it spinning left, some people oh. see it spinning right, and they, they don't, and they sometimes it switches from, and people can't agree whether it's to the right or to the left. And at the end, somebody came to me and said, but what does it really do? Does it spin right or left? I said, it's all in your mind. So oh. sometimes we are seeing things very differently. For example, there was also very neat uh, debate in the internet about the dress. You remember the dress? You know the dress? That is, some people see it as blue and sometimes yeah, some yeah. people see it as oh. gold. Or the, yeah. Amazing difference, and people don't agree and see that. So we are not identical. We don't see things the same. So how do you do again? I said, depending on your background, visual background, we'll see things differently. How do you think yeah. people synch synchronization between people? 
If this is what so, you say, how do you create? No, 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 no. The synchronization is, a, I mean, the most important thing about human beings, the other animals is like us, but we are really an extreme case is socializing. In other words, cooperative action. That what made human progress, you know, the ability to cooperate, co collaborate. And this um, has started to be studied more and more. It's more difficult to study because you need to study two brains, at least simultaneously, how they interact. The beautiful studies showing that every time somebody makes some, does something, we predict ahead of time what they're going to do. We have a whole apparatus in our brain that is dedicated to reading the minds of other people. And it's a big debate how we do it. For example, some people might say that we use simulation. In other words, the reason we understand that we are individuals, part of it might be because we need it to understand what other people think. You know, I see you make a frown and I say, okay, what would I have thought if, and would make me do the same frown? And that's how I understand your mind. So there are interesting issues about how we how we understand each other. And there is a huge dedication of effort in our brain that is apart from the visual system that is dedicated to mind reading. This is not my own field of study. I want also to talk a little bit about the, about the subconscious. Yes, um, just a second. I want, there's also- So far I talked about things that we are aware of, but there is a vast ocean of yes. activity that goes below our conscious experience. Recently, I would say this is more my field of interest than to the Yeah, but you do deal with system, philosophy. So. I know that you're interested in philosophy and do you connect the discipline in research? And then we'll go to the consciousness. Uh, interesting. I, I will not call myself philosopher. I, the question I, I mentioned, for example, the issue Will we ever be able to connect brain activity to experience is a philosophical question. So naturally, when you are doing sort of large scale questions in the brain, you have to, to touch and interact with philosophers, but I'm not, I will not consider myself a philosopher. I'm total amateur there, uh, but I'm touching my question. My studies are touching on philosophy and they are of interest to philosophers and, you know, because they derive some intuitions and thinking from experimental results. I'm basically an experimentalist. I look at the brain, try to, to listen to what the brain is saying and try to come up with solutions or understandings based on, based on experimental findings that we have. I, I will not uh, define myself as a philosopher, although I'm very fascinated by this. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <clears throat> Let's talk a little bit about you subconscious no, no, yeah. okay. you know because uh, is it okay with you i mean you, or you want oh, yes because i think it's a, a vast field yeah <coughs> and i'll tell you and i'll tell you sort of my perspective a lot of interest uh, has been dedicated and i think um, not very productively to the question of subconscious seeing you probably remember, I don't know, when I was a kid, it was like uh, in the news, uh, the, the claim that you can uh, 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 present ads that are so fast that the person does not consciously experience it, yet they force them to go and buy Coca-Cola later. That turns out to be wrong, no, not working. But there was this belief that, you know, a lot of things that we see come subconsciously, you know, and affect us. I don't think this is a fruitful uh, study of subconscious. I'll tell you what, where I see the power of the subconscious processes. It is in the following phenomena that I'm sure you all had, probably TP, you had it in the, in the domain of, uh, of uh, movie making. And this is the following, you have a problem. You know, let's say I have a scientific problem. It actually occurred to me, some results, that you're trying to understand the phenomena that you know looks very powerful and you don't understand where it's coming from. So you break your head, you break your head, no answer comes. You let it go, you forget about it. And two days later, with no anticipation, completely surprising, out. the entire solution comes in front of you. 
it's like magic. I mean, it happened to me, and when it happens, you know, the classic historical case is, of course, uh, Archimedes, who had this problem, uh, not get into detail, of um, actually fascinating problem of finding out whether the crown of the king was made of pure gold or false, or just covered with gold without, without damaging the crown, and he solved it. And it, the solution probably broke his head on, on it for, for days. And suddenly the solution came and he jumped out of uh, the bathtub and ran naked, calling Eureka, Eureka. So this is a, you know, a very powerful, and this, if you think about it, is, a, is, a, is something coming out of the subconscious processing. Why am I saying subconscious? Because it's true that you were bothered by it and you said, I must solve the problem. This is conscious. But then there was a long period of something happening below your awareness. You did not know that it's happening. It happens in the bathtub. Some students tell me that it happens when they run. In other words, you are completely unaware of this amazing process that goes on below your consciousness level that suddenly comes up with a creative solution. So if you think about it, the dynamo, the source, the creator of, uh, of creativity in human culture, in human art, in human science is a subconscious process. It's something that happens below our awareness that is actually moving humanity forward. How can you if follow? You about every, every, you know, Einstein, relativity theory, he said it was one of the most happiest thoughts that ever came to my mind. Um, and now with brain, with brain, uh, we didn't talk about the methodology that I'm using, okay? But they, we are using, we can study what happened in the brain without interfering with somebody's, um, you know, without telling them to do something or all that. You can ask people to just, um, you know, lie without doing anything in the magnet, in the MRI scanner. And we can follow with this amazing technology called brain imaging that was invented 30 years ago, you can actually follow what happens in the brain. That's one of the most powerful How do you know it's subconscious? And um, okay. because you, you are not that? aware that it's happening. Did you know before? Did you, did you know before the moment? Did, did I know before the moment that I came? Yeah. All of a sudden, oh, without yeah. you knowing it, without yeah, you being result. able to it's predict a moment yes. before it happened, a moment before it happened, you were you despaired. You were despaired. You said, well, I'll never solve the problem. And suddenly, bang. And then By the way, happen? one of my findings was after I, during sleep, I slept, went to sleep, woke up in the morning, opened my eyes, and the solution was right there. Complete. And not only this, it is complete, and you know it's true. There's no this sense of... Uh, and I actually was joking as I wrote the paper describing this discovery that maybe I'm not allowed to be, I should not be the author because I personally, Rafi, didn't, in my conscious being, did not actually come up with the solution. Somebody inside my brain was doing this uh, process. And the, the nice thing, why I'm telling you all that, I'm not an expert on creativity, but we found a brain mechanism, a brain phenomena that we think is the subconscious process that is leading to, to our creative process. And these are, uh, we didn't talk about what happens in the brain when we see something, you know, we see an image. So I'll tell you what happened is a, a sort of an intense burst of, of um, activity of groups of neurons in the visual system. We call it ignition. It's really like lighting a fire. Suddenly the neurons, get into a mode of being excited, like they're all shouting hooray together kind of thing. And then you see, you know, when the correct neurons, nerve cells in your brain, in the visual system, that let you represent the image of Tsipi, jump up, I say, ah, this is Tsipi. That's how I see it. When this unconscious, um, uh, how do you call it? Uh, incubation, incubation of creativity happens. It's a completely different story, different dynamics of the nerve cells. They, they enter into a mode that we call spontaneous fluctuation. These are very, very slow, going up and going down of activity of many, many nerve cells that are involved. 
that go up and down and change. And you see these patterns coming and going in the brain. It's fascinating to look and it has a lot of information, but they are very slow and very weak. So they don't create a conscious experience. They're below the surface and suddenly they hit on the solution and then they burst into activity. So we can actually see how this slow process that is completely unconscious. We know that we did some studies that show that this spontaneous fluctuation, very, very slow. They take seconds to develop. How they explore the landscape of possible solutions while you are not aware of it. You might be taking a shower, you but might be not sleeping. it's 100% not aware because you plant an idea or a question wishing to have a solution or maybe. Absolutely. And you basically uh, allow all the little dots to wake up a little bit, you shake it, and it depends if it takes two seconds or two days or two weeks, you know, and then eventually it comes to you. So either you're obsessive and you push yourself or you just let it go and it comes, depends how it goes. But I don't think that it's unconscious totally because you- No, no, you're completely it. correct. No, 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 I didn't say totally unconscious. You are completely correct. Without obsession, without this, um, Need. Sometimes it feels yeah. like an itch, an itch, yeah. you know, you, you must solve the problem, it drives you crazy. Without that, which is completely conscious, I'll call it trigger, or I call it yeah. passion, actually, passion. The, the right word is passion. Without the passion to solve, nothing will happen. Right. No, solu no uh, problem will be solved if the person is not passionate to solve it. By the way, no art will be generated without passion. So I, I don't think Mozart would have come up with these symphonies without some passionate urge to, to, to come up with this amazing music that was burning inside. So what a connection between- And we know actually what happens in the brain when you are passionate. What? We know, we actually studied it. Uh, what happens is I told you about these slow yeah. fluctuations and if you are, let's say, I'm passionate about solving some uh, scientific problem. Tip is passionate about solving some uh, well, movie yeah. problem. Yeah. What will happen, and we know that, we studied it, in my brain, the, the nerve cells that are, that are related to the, the, to the final solution, the, the landscape, let's say this will be in some kind of mathematical uh, center in my brain, the waves there will become slightly stronger. In other words, they'll become closer to this moment of ignition, to the moment of bursting in hooray, and all the rest of the brain will be cooled. And this is very important because you don't want to be creative all the time. Otherwise, you know, it'll be chaotic. I'll be jumping up and right. down here right. in sort of anarchic, ticking way. You know, that's in pathological condition. You want your creativity well controlled bounded within the domain you want to be creative and we know that then when you are doing that and you're really passionate whoops these waves become stronger it's as if the wind became stronger or mm -hmm. or another metaphor is if it is as if there is a hamsin you know the the temperature in the in the in the landscape is becoming higher in this domain and then the chances of this ignition are much higher to find the, 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 the solution. So with definitely the brain, our brain has ability to allocate where it wants these subconscious processes to be more intense and less intense. By the way, another very, very important factor, we didn't talk about it, is internal knowledge. I will not be able to produce symphonies. No way, I produce maybe solutions in brain science, not symphonies, why? Because I never incorporated science, uh, musical knowledge. I don't have it in my blood, so to speak. Mozart had it in his blood from childhood and all the connections in the brain, all the organization of, of his brain and neurons are geared already by the learning, by the internalization, by the intuition towards music. Not surprisingly, then the spontaneous activity will elicit unbelievable, beautiful music, uh, symphonies and so forth in Mozart and not in me. 
Same thing, Mozart will not be able to come up with some solution to scientific problem. He doesn't have the knowledge, intuition. And what so you're forth. saying? So our experience, our knowledge, our genetics, by the way, there's also genetic component. You know, we are born with talent. They are all influencing the structures in our brain on which these spontaneous waves are playing their game. So Does it's it a combination. Work? Does it work the opposite way? Like if you look to find something that you would like to do and you can't really know exactly what it means, can you trigger the system to work for your help? Without knowing what you want. That's an interesting question. Silly. I haven't thought about it. <laughs> But I'll tell you another thing that I think is very, very important. If you think about what I said, I talked about the positive things, you know, internalizing knowledge, symphonies, and maybe physics in the case of Einstein. But we also internalize traumas. Okay. We internalize uh, awful things that happen to us. And in that case, instead of getting creative uh, yeah. insight, we will get some experiences that come spontaneously without our control, that reflect in pathological cases, they reflect the traumas, But in lamb, less pathological case, they will reflect some thoughts we have, worries we have. You know, you sit down, you close your eyes. People who do meditation report about it all the time. You have these thoughts that come spontaneously to your mind without your control. You don't, you don't even maybe want them, but they come. And they typically reflect your experiences, what worries you, what kind of uh, affected you. And I have to acknowledge here the genius of Sigmund Freud in that respect, that at the beginning of psychoanalysis, one of the tools that he sort of put forward, we really with a genius intuition, without knowing about this spontaneous fluctuation of our brain, he realized that if you just let somebody lie on the bed without interruption, without instructing them what to think, let them just freely ruminate you will be exposing the traumas, the worries, the problems that the brain has. And now we found many, many years later that it insight was completely backed up by in your science, uh, our studies of the so brain. So what's the connection? Because the, shape, because the shape of these spontaneous Wait. waves, the, yeah. way, the way they form depends completely on your history, on your experience. We show it in experiment. As and many, many other groups, and I'll explain to you in a moment why it is so important. We find that these spontaneous wave patterns that we see in the brain reflect your history, mm -hmm. reflect what worries you, reflect your talent, you reflect your knowledge. In fact, they reflect who you are, if you think about it. And why, why is it so important practically? Because they also reflect pathologies of the brain. Right. For example, it is well known that you can predict now, for example, the onset of Alzheimer, a devastating mental condition, you know, where people lose their memory. You can see it uh, before we are really the full onset in the changes of these patterns of what we call spontaneous fluctuation. We study um, people with autism uh, and we show that they have a unique type of patterns. Right. So these uh, patterns are not just... Uh, a curiosity that can actually become a very powerful tool to understand who you well, are and maybe yeah. what you're suffering from and things like that. Right. We are at the beginning. I don't want to create here um, an illusion okay. that we are uh, ready to read your mind and understand who you are, but, but it's, a, it's a very um, um, important So how is AI comes into, AI, how it comes into, you know, you know artificial intelligence, how it comes into yes. your research? Oh, that's not the right. I mean, I didn't. It comes, it. it comes, it comes, and I'll tell you, I'll tell you um, exactly how it comes. A lot of times we make a discovery about the brain, and we don't know the meaning of this discovery. You see, for example, we did a study looking at how the brain responds to different faces of individuals, your face, you know, other people, and we found that some faces create similar patterns of brain activity and other faces create very different patterns. And, you know, we have this data, we have this 
collection of similarities and dissimilarities, but it's difficult to understand what are they telling us? Why does the brain does it? Maybe it has no meaning. And here comes artificial intelligence because um, artificial intelligence in the visual domain has arrived at a power, I don't know if people are aware of it, that in terms, for example, of face recognition, they are doing better than human observers. Yeah. So a, an artificial network could recognize faces better than humans can do, especially unfamiliar faces. So we have here a machine, a robot basically, that performs at least this specific function equally or better than the human. Now we can do the following argument. We can say, okay, we found this phenomena. I'm talking about the visual system, but it can apply to anywhere in the brain. We found this phenomena in the brain that we don't understand. Let's go and see. Maybe we will find the same phenomena in the robot, in the artificial intelligence. And if we suddenly find this coincidence, because, you know, a robot was built by a totally different process and engineers sat there and they tried this and tried that. Eventually they came with this artificial intelligent network. If this network coming, trying to solve face recognition in a completely different way, suddenly shows the same property that we discover in the brain, we say, aha, this is not coincident. We call it convergent evolution. Maybe I'll illustrate it a little bit with, a meta, with, a, with an example that is more, makes more sense. Imagine a, a, an alien landing on, on, on Earth, and he's seeing, you know, uh, he sees these animals that if they, they fly in the air and they have wings, you know, let's say pigeons, okay? They have this extension. He doesn't understand anything about flying, anything about aerodynamics. He just sees that certain animals, pigeons, uh, that, that he finds them flying also has wings. Okay. So Coincident, maybe they use it for something like that. Then he goes and sees that engineers, human engineers, they develop machines called airplanes that are meant to fly in the air, and they also have these things that look like wings. You know, then he can make the saying, wait a minute, this is weird coincidence. Two things developed, one by engineers, one by biology. Both of them fly in the air and they develop exactly the same structure. That's not a coincidence. That means wings are essential for flying. Very common sense. You don't need to understand aerodynamics in order to understand that wings are essential for, uh, for flying by comparing airplanes with pigeons. You follow the logic? We call it convergent evolution. Like in order to solve a problem, completely different systems invent the same solution. Now we apply it into the brain and to artificial intelligence. We say the following. If an artificial intelligence that was built by some Japanese engineers, actually Canadian, uh, very, very important scientists to recognize faces, comes up with the same wing-like structure, in our case, a particular pattern of behavior that we find in the human brain, this is not a coincidence. That tells us that this pattern is essential for recognizing faces. And that's a big uh, way to move forward. And you can apply it to many, you know, now there are amazing, amazing artificial intelligence system that for example, can generate speech, text, you know, they can, uh, I don't know if you heard, but there was a big scandal in Google now that one of the employees claimed that the text machine actually is a- uh, It was fired. It was fired, but, but still it turns you the power of this machine that they can really imitate. So again, you can start playing this game of comparing convergent evolution between artificial system and the brain and learn from it, um, so you, uh, you know, get educated more. about the function. Yeah, we can create and Rafi Malach. also, you know, the entire, hmm, say it again. We can create Rafi Malach. Not exactly. AI. Oh, AI. let's not get carried AI. away. Exactly. Because I said there is a huge mystery. Let's not forget the mystery. We don't understand yet our human psychology comes out from physics. Yeah. We can imitate behavior <laughs> to a certain degree, face recognition. It does not mean that the network that does face recognition experiences silly 
a tipi as, as she appears. Yeah, it has this know. ability and we can it study can it, but if the not man mean it has experience, then we can ask, okay, so what is the difference? Say it again. I'll tell you what, we can create the ultimate the malach without the, the bad stuff or without the weak stuff. So then you have a perfect human being, you know. So but this cannot the connection oh between goodness. psychology and biology. I don't even good. want to don't even want to talk about it because who will decide what is good and That's what right. is bad? Right. Right. So yeah. tell me, so then, uh, you actually also kind of explain the connection between psychology and neurology. It will, I said. There is no way, right now for sure, we cannot explain the connection between neurology and psychology. We can draw lines, okay. rules. That is not an explanation. I can tell you, listen, some ignition in the back of my mind is associated with me seeing the sunset. But you say, but why should, you'll ask me, why should, you know, electricity between some bunch of neurons will result in sunset? No answer. I don't know. And I don't, I'm not sure we will ever know. You know, in science, we have to be humble. We don't, there's not, all the questions are not necessarily answerable. We are working on it. We learn more and more. I told you about patterns. I told you about ignition. I told you about different kind of knowledge. We have a huge amount of knowledge and understanding, but explanation in the sense that, you, that I can, for example, explain to you how a piano works, you know? You hit a, a, a key and it vibrates and creates waves in the air. I can explain it all. There's no way I can explain in a similar manner how exchange of some tiny pulses of electricity between millions of neurons in the back of my brain create the image uh, of, uh, of the tree right now outside of the window. How did you start? So we are not I... there and I'm not sure we'll ever be there and I'm fine with it. I like the magic. I, I like this the, is your passion. the open question. Find it. This is your passion. So who inspired you? How did you start? How did you get? You started with vision, right? Started with vision. Uh, who inspired you? Uh, good question. I think what was really stimulating, there was, a, I actually recommend this book. It's, I think it translated to Hebrew also. It's called The Intelligent Eye by Richard Gregory. And it, it really presents in a beautiful manner this, um, this idea of the creative nature of, of seeing by illustration, you know, you actually see, it shows you with visual illusion and all that, that it's really all in our mind, you know, all this seeing and all that. And I think that was a, a really powerful insight to realize. And if you think deeply about it, it's a very, very deep insight. I mean, philosopher from Plato to Kant has dealt with it extensively. It's a deep insight to understand that we are actually creating the world. We are creating the image of ourselves, by the way, not only the world. We don't, didn't talk about self-image and the, all this uh, feeling of agency and control and all that. These are all brain creations. So this is a deep, deep insight that really started me getting excited about and this. And what are you working Starting... on right now? Say it again. What are you working on right now? What is your right now? We are working on uh, two topics. Uh, one is we are trying to sort of understand better this slow, spontaneous fluctuation in terms of um, of modeling, and we are very interested. I didn't. It was too technical, so I didn't get into it. Into this issue that what really matters about what we are seeing is not. It's not really. We don't really think it's the brain activity. I said ignition for simplicity, what we really think is important. This are, by the way, concepts that were originated in linguistics many, many years ago by Ferdinand de Saussure, I don't know if you know the name, that argued in the linguistic domain that a concept is not defined by the concept itself. A mountain is not defined by the mountain. A mountain is defined by its relations yeah. to other concepts. So yeah. a mountain is a mountain because it is similar to a hill, and very different from a valley. We are applying this uh, same idea and exploring it in the brain that I see Tsipi not because the, there is a certain activity of Tsipi, but because 
Tzipi is similar to Jane Fonda and not to Barack Obama, for example. Oh, okay. And these similarities... Well, now we believe you. Can you really say Jane Fonda? Her? I don't know. <laughs> Obama. I think we have to, to stop here. So uh, we are exploring this uh, deep we concept of relational coding, we call it. Yeah. <laughs> so I just want to tell you it was so nice to end up with me as a Jane Fonda. That's right. Let's uh, keep it this way. Listen, it was wonderful. <laughs> and you see what drives him really is what he started. Thank you. Passion is a passion. Passion is right? a passionate man. Unbelievable. Passionate Therefore, he's such a great scientist. Yep. Thank you for your Thank time. You, Thank Good you, Rafi. Good luck. And, and you were a passionate yes. listener. So I and, hope you, and I hope you I want to it. give you compliments for excellent questions also. But of so course. And we are going to be here next week. And stay well. And, and uh, see you, everybody. See you, everybody. Thank Take you, care. Take Bye. care. Bye. Yeah, it was, it was really great, great talking to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.